name is Zan Bradford. You're watching my community, and we'll be right back. Hello and welcome. It is your weekly program that has always been concerned with the virtual gathering. That is the gathering that occurs on air and online. I'm Sherwood McCaskey, as always. Thanks for your time. In last week's program, Marcia Graham walked us through her beloved Greenwich in St. James. This week, we shall take an overarching view of the parish and detail how it has contributed to the social and economic transformation of Barbados. It is a story of Panama money, the unique position of a parish, and how that parish, in a sense, lightened the burden of government as it related to being an employer of the people, and how it brought those people away from starvation wages that were being paid out on the plantation. We begin with a former senator and a retired high school principal who enjoys researching Barbadian history and sharing it with all. Take it over, Mr. Adams. St. James is such an interesting parish in relation to its development that if a person had left the island in the 1940s and returned by the end of the century, they would be amazed to see the transformation that had taken place. Because like most of Barbados, especially after you leave the west coast of St. James, you would encounter rows and rows of sugarcane fields interspersed with plantation tenantries and villages. Now, all of that has changed. As a matter of fact, if we fa fast forward to today, there is perhaps not a single cane blade in the whole of the parish of St. James. And a substantial amount of, of sugar had been produced in the St. James, James parish because Porter's, in fact, at one point was the premier factory in the island. And that is recorded on history's page. The story of the evolution of this parish, so to speak, is an interesting one, from plantation tenantries to development, heights, and terraces. To fully understand this transition, we must continue to place things in the correct perspective. To do so, Mr. Adams centers his discussion around two plantations in the parish. These plantations were pretty substantial plantations. The Water Hall and Apes Hill were owned by the Walcotts. And, and that Walcott would have been the brother of E.K. Walcott. So you can see the connections there as well. So they had tenantries, they had plantation tenantries, which is a very important concept in the history of Barbados. And the, the tenantry needs to be discussed a little bit. The first thing about the tenantry is that the workers were allowed to have a spot. Sometimes it might be a quarter acre or so, sometimes less than that, sometimes a mere spot. But quite a number of times it was enough for them to work. But they had to pay rent for it. They couldn't own it. And in return for that favor, they had to work on the plantation. Not only did they work, have to work on the plantation, but for starvation wages. One dollar, one, one shilling and sixpence, one shilling and threepence. I'm talking about 30 cents a day, which was not enough money to feed a family of just one child. And, well, the, the, the tenants would tend to get supplemental things from the ground. So the, the Barbados small agricultural peasant farmer started out in that kind of way and, and in, indeed produce a substantial amount of the produce in the island. They would, yes, they would also have backyard domestic animals. This is a very interesting concept. The plantation people, even though they had all these hundreds of acres of land, never, up to my time, and I was born in 1943, they never allowed the tenants to tie or graze their 
clock on the plantation grass pieces. This, this is a fact. If they missed and did that, the watchman, who was the eyes and ears of the, the plantation owner, he would confiscate the animal, take it into the plantation yard, and the peasant would have the tenantry from, from, the, from the tenantry would have to pay to get the animal back. And sometimes that would be an entire day's pay or more, so that it was kept in perpetual uh, poverty. Um, in fact, I think Bedford, uh, Beckford spoke about persistent poverty, and that is part of, of it. That is evidence on the plantations in Barbados at that time. In fact, George Beckford's book Persistent Poverty, Under Development in Plantation Economies of the Third World, clearly shows how a plantation laborer was kept in that cycle of poverty. So, so that the Barbadian agricultural worker in the, in the tenantry was tied to the tenantry, which is, which is scarcely a step away from slavery. And not only did he, did he have to work on the land, very often his children would have to work on the land. And so you got what you could call intergenerational poverty. And, and that is really what my own family was born into in Springhead, which I would come to know. Now, when you get the chance, when the CBC gets the chance, it ought to go to Springhead. Unfortunately, Springhead is private property access is restricted. Springhead is indeed one of the most picturesque places in the island. It is just to the north of Apesil, and Apesil, of course, is very picturesque as well. It looks into the Scotland district to the east and the east coast, and to the west, right back down to the west coast, the Caribbean Sea. This is one of the few areas of Barbados where that happens. And apart from that, it is called Springhead for a reason. Springs were there. And that's the head of the spring. And clear, fresh water, certainly in those days, um, would come from Springhead. And then adjoining Springhead was a place called the Spring. And then you came into Waterhall. Uh, so that is quite fascinating from a geographical and environmental uh, point of view. Maybe the Waterworks Department here ought to uh, look into that. But also in Springhead is a very historic cave. One of the most historic caves in Barbados, maybe outside of the one in St. Thomas. And it still has the petroglyphs of the original persons. And it would be interesting for government to allow um, the National Trust and other, certainly the National Trust probably did. But people at Cayfield, the, the, the scholars, the young, young people, should really know about this. This is the history that we should know. We don't want to know all these other esoteric um, things. Uh, so therefore, you had this, this ambiance thing. But to go with that was the fact that it had a substantial tenantry. This is where my grandfather and my parents and so on uh, came from. And the, you know, I like to speak ill of the dead, but from all accounts, the owner was quite oppressive. My grandfather kind of took him on. And he was well, like almost the only person to have done that. I think that is in the blood. <laughs> I don't think he was able to do that because when Panama opened up, my grandfather, I understand, had the opportunity to go. He was the, the, the oldest of some brothers. But instead of going himself, probably to, he probably remained to look after father and mother and so on, he allowed two of his brothers to go off to Panama when the canal was being built. And one of them in particular sent back the remittances to him. This is very significant. Remittances from Panama is considerable. In today's money, millions, if not billions of dollars. It, it actually scared 
the, the plantocracy here in Barbados. To the extent I could deal, deal with that now, to the extent that they went to Parliament to pass a law to prevent the persons with the Panama money from buying at, at one point 10 acres, from buy, buying more than 10 acres of land, with so much money coming back, and at some point more than even two acres of land. It is something that needs to be mentioned. So my grandfather, with the money that his brother sent back, did two things. He bought a horse and cart, which gave him an element of independence, which the persons on the tenantry should not have. And he also bought two spots of land in Westmoreland, which is where I was born. So because he was a thorn in the side of the plantation owner, he used to use his horse and cart to carry meat and so on to Eagle Hall and the market, wherever the market is. All I know, you don't know a town that well. And you know, that gave him an element of, of, um, of independence. And he would work the land. People in those days worked their land. They, they rotated crops, they, all sorts of things. But he died young. In fact, in the late 30s, I ought to mention this, things were so hard in Barbados that he, he and, and, and my grandmother decided that perhaps he ought to let my, his, my um, older, eldest uncle, who would be his first son, carry out the meat with the horse and so on. And at the time, they were kind of doing some roads. And when you were uh, building roads, you actually had to sit down and break rocks with a, a special type of hammer. And he was not accustomed to that kind of work. And, and the rest of my family feels that it broke his heart. It, 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 it knocked his heart off the, off the face. But that might be a joke. But he died, he died young. But because he had given the plantation owner so much trouble, when he died, Messiah sent his men, watchmen and so on, and took the house down off the tenantry. He had the power, that is the kind of power that they had. And my grandmother had 13 children. The story of the Adams family will be fully detailed in another series called Our People. Meanwhile, signs of progress are on the horizon. Our people are beginning to see some changes. By the 1950s, the government had been doing a lot of things, the new black government, because the, the franchise came in 1951, and a whole range of things began to happen. Um, pipe tracks began to be laid, because um, in Westmoreland, we had to go up Gamble Hill for water. And when the pipe traps came, they brought it down, down into the village. Um, the villagers had no water. Obviously, every house had a pit toilet, it, it, however great you were. They had no electricity and obviously no telephone and so on. But the, 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 the wires, the poles, would go from plantation house to plantation house. And it is, <laughs> it is only after the black government came into power that the water came into the area and so on. You're watching my community and we'll be right back. People started to go to, to England and a number of my relatives went. My mother didn't go. She was thinking, oh there she go, her, you know, her children would suffer or something. So she didn't go, she remained. Um, but she didn't work in the fields. She worked in, as a servant, um, starting with the bay houses. In fact, she never worked at the hotels, but because I'm coming to down the hill. Um, I'm saying all of this to say that the western part of St. James was kind of different from the agricultural belt. And the people had a different outlook and everything else. For example, a lot of them were fishermen. Scarcely anybody from the Westmoreland and Sahel Hill and so on could swim. <laughs> and, um, and rather than selling potatoes and yams, they sold fish. And um, they, they, they had a different um, kind of um, situation. They were also, you would want to say, a, a bit more progressive because however you want to look at it, things, th things were happening down there that didn't happen up in Springhead and places like that. Buses. Um, in Westmoreland area, we would get one or two morning buses. By 9 o'clock, you would get no other bus. 
and by six or seven o'clock, no other bus. So if you were, didn't catch those buses, you would have to come down to St. Albans and walk up and all that sort of thing. And the situation was that my, my mother um, worked at these different houses and so on in the area. Mr. Adams' mother is part of a wave that will usher in that major transformation in St. James, which contributed greatly to the overall social and economic transformation of Barbados. Exactly what is happening on the West Coast at this time? The West Coast, which I will switch to now, began to be developed, not originally in terms of hotels, but a number of, of Investors from outside are buying up houses on the sands on the seaside um, side. In fact, when the land was being sold out from the plantations, the first land that they sold out was the land on the seaside because it was deemed not to be good for agriculture. And, and now it is gold. Even at that time, it was gold. So people from England in particular started to buy up the land, maybe from people who owned it and build houses and so on. One that, sta a lot, number of them stand up, but one that really stood out was Heron Bay. Heron Bay was owned by Ronald Tree. And Ronald Tree was a, a, a major person in the United Kingdom. And he moved here to Barbados. There were people by the name of Commander Landeer. There were persons by the name of Marson. And all these people had um, houses along there. Queen's Fort and Bachelor Hall. Um, Manga Bay, down by St. Albans, there are two Manga Bays, one in Whole Town. All those kinds of properties began to develop. And by the middle or so of 50s, Marson, for example, I think he changed his, his great house into a Miramar. And then you had the Colony Club. And on you had Sandy Lane. I think Sandy Lane came into being around the late 1957, 58, around there, when the, it was a factory. And, you know, it was a wooded area and so on. And it was Ronald Tree who um, went forward, maybe with some a conglomerate and so on, and built the hotel in Sandy Lane. They changed the road. Um, just before I was finishing school and so on, the Sandy Lane Road, that was one of the widest roads in Barbados. Um, around the late 1950s. Later on, the East Coast Road came in when Mr. Barry came into power. He, but one of his pledges was be to link up the East Coast, and the East Coast Road was built around 1962, 63, around there. But Sandy Lane was built. And so, you get a situation now where you're getting a diversification of the Barbados economy in a very significant way. On the western side of St. James is the epicenter of this diversification. The physical landscape of the area is drastically transforming and our people are positioning themselves to assume new roles and engage in a newer form of work away from the drudgery of the plantation. These are exciting times in the parish of St. James. This pressure is relieved from the government because people are going off to England in the, in the, in the, uh, by boat at first and then later on I went to I went by plane later and the hotels are employing people so several people especially women who would be trudging in the fields in Carrollton and Westmoreland and places like that are going down to the west coast to work in the hotel industry they and they're in nice uniforms and all that sort of thing they're not in the sun etc etc and a number of of, of boys even from the high schools are now also working in the in the hotels particularly Sandy Lane you had people like Chapman Burnham who eventually became had a managerial job there Tim Boyce um, in fact a gentleman called George Fort from here in Holders Hill he started out as a as a yard boy really as, as a laborer at Sandy Lane and he rose up to the, 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 the category of a manager and so on, and was able actually to build a house over there in, in, in John's Plains area. So that is the kind of development that would have been taking place in Barbados 
even before some of the others that, that we're talking about. And a little later on, this time now I was teaching at St. Albans, I was finished work, and I was teaching at St. Leonard's when it first started out. They have a shift system there, like what they're doing now. This shift system is nothing new. That was the first uh, shift system in Barbados, and I, I taught in the first, yeah, shift system. And I was wondering how come they didn't come up with it earlier. Anyway, on my way up, I began to see that two, two little things, one is a joke. I, I see some, some boarding going up and so on. And that is at Sunset Crest. Sunset Crest is beginning to develop into what you, you'll see it there. And Sandy Lane Estates, my mother is working for a man called Cushman. She's working as the cook and so on. I, can, I remember this all the time because she would bring home some of these sweet food and so on. <laughs> and they always, they always ate late. That was all right with her because if she was still living up, if she had to come up West morning, it would be difficult. But she had moved down to the, to the West Coast, just above the fire station. So she would still get home and, you know, bring the food and so on that left over uh, for us. Uh, Cushman was his name. So that development that happened around the golf course and so on, he was one of the major persons. He came from the United States. My mother worked with him for years. After that, she worked at Bachelor Hall. And before that, she worked for a man called Charters New Haven down in St. Peter. He, when he was dead, uh, Marcia speaking, he actually bought the great house in Morgan, Greenwich Village. And my mother worked there too with him before they went down to New Haven. And he, his wife was an uh, agriculturalist, and they had cows and all that sort of thing um, out there. So my, my mother worked there. So essentially, the diversification of the West Coast in that sense is different from what was occurring elsewhere and certainly in St. James. Chris Sobers identifies another type of transformation that has taken place in the parish. I bought the land here in 1956, and at that time, Torres Plantation was being sold. Um, I understand that the plantation was in chancery for apparently many years because nobody has been able to tell me when Torres produced sure again. So it was apparently an abandoned plantation that was in chancery for many years, as I said earlier. Now, the, interestingly enough, the land the, on the eastern side of the road from St. John Baptist to Hall Village was, I would put it at possibly between maybe 40, 50 acres of land was bought by people mainly from the North of Barbados. Um, mostly all farmers, because everybody was into farming, as you know, everybody grew. In fact, when I was growing up in this district, the folks around here grew canes, mainly uh, the largest amount was canes, but they grew corn, potatoes, yams, edos, cassava, peas, all types of crops. In fact, I would say it was a kind of mixed farming community. And in fact, we also, we were into dairy into, because I remember we wanted, we had about 14 cows. <laughs> and so, so that was the kind of community. But I got some community. And, but the Western site, that was bought by the government. And it stretches, uh, there's a considerable of land below here. And I think those houses were built, they started at least around 19, 57 or 58 in that, that, around that time. Because I remember something that brings back, that back to mind is this. A hurricane, when they were being built, and this, this is what, I could see it now as a little boy. A hurricane had passed Barbados, and I think it was due to hit Barbados. But it, it swerved to the north of the island. But the winds were quite high. And I remember when they were putting in the windows, they were blown back by that hurricane. And the, the first side of the house was right there. Those houses were right there. I remember that very well. And they were blown right, blown back. And I, of course, I had to adjust them after. When I came here, no houses were here, below here. Uh, it was sparsely populated. The was sparsely populated. No people lived on the land here and so on. And so it was just mainly the few people who came in from the north. And their coming later influenced the development of other areas in the parish, Oxnards, Wanstead. 
Husbands West Terrace. Now, according to the National Regathering Calendar 2020, the parish of St. James was set to celebrate cricket. Weekly, many assemble, or perhaps I should say gather here on these grounds to enjoy a recreational activity. Have you given thought to the origins of this ground? People like Ronald Tree, and then you also had Oliver Messels, and Messels and Reese. They were in Maddox and so on there below there. They, they, they were either close to the royal family or members of the royal family. And Messels and those, they were interior decorators. They did a lot of work in Mastique, in St. Vincent and so on. Those were the days when Barbados was kind of humming and so on. Ronald Tree is at Heron Bay. When Princess Margaret and the, those kinds of people came here, that is where they stayed. And nobody could go on the beach in that area. Um, I remember all these things uh, like now. So Ronald Tree, it was mentioned in um, the book that Greenwich wrote, said that he had noticed, he always had an interest in the youth and so on in the island though. He noticed that some of the young people were around the corner gambling and so on. And he doesn't want to see that happening around the whole town and so on area. He wants to have some wholesome activity and so on for them. You're watching my community and we'll be right back. If you look at it, you will see that there's a, a, a wide expanse of land to the east of Heron Bay. And he was going to give that land as a playing field. And if you read Morris Greenwich's book, he said that the, the, his secretary and so on said, oh, no, 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 that would, you know, that would spoil the whole thing. But, you know, if the queen comes, only so you can't have a fellow's book, they'll play about a ball. <laughs> so then he negotiated with the persons who were in charge of the trends. It was in, in, in kind of transfer, and he negotiated and bought about four or five acres of land. And that is the Maple. story behind Maple Cricket Ground. It needs to be told, yes, because in whole town and, and in the whole of the West Coast, there was no place to play. There was, there was a place called the Merlin um, on the sea. And they played BCL cricket there. And what the, 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 what the, um, the guys from the, the, the Merlin team would do, I think they called themselves the Boys Club, Western Boys Club, they would make sure that they get, hit the, if they are batting, hit the ball in the, in the sea early. <laughs> 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 this, but this is a fact. Good, the good cricketers came from, from down there. Um, my fellow called Charlie Hendy, played for us cricket cricket for, for, um, for police and so on, and Maple and so on. And, um, so there was no place that people could play. Um, and therefore, apart from the Merlin, whole town had absolutely no place, apart from the fact that they were bold enough to ask Porter's persons to let them play at Dominion. Absolutely no, no place. Young men, good cricketers, etc. These are the people that, that formed the Maple Cricket Club. So out of that came the land Maple Cricket um, Club and a social centre. So apart from, apart from the Buccaneer, which had its two sides to it, the social centre at Trent's was the other place that people held dances and did all that sort of thing. A glimpse of the role the parish of St. James played in the social and economic transformation of Barbados. Thanks to Alwyn Adams and Chris Boyce, this has been My Community St. James until next week when we begin our journey in the parish of Christchurch. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. It's goodbye for now.